it, it might be time to start to reassess the terms we use to, <laughs> to describe what we're watching. So when I started at Heritage, the presumption was, and this is a very Anglo-American assumption, that the debates we're having are kind of rational debates about the way to get to mutually agreed upon outcomes. Right, so like we all want the country to be more prosperous and free and people to be less oppressed or whatever. And so we're gonna argue about tax rates and I think higher tax gets, gets us there. I'm a Keynesian and you disagree, you're an Austrian or whatever. But the objective is the same. And so we write our papers and they write their papers and may the best papers win. I, I, I don't think that's what we're watching now at all. I don't think we're watching a debate over how to get to the best outcome. I think that's completely wrong. And I've come to this conclusion, not, and I should say at the outset, I'm an Episcopalian, so don't take any theological advice from me, because I don't have any. I grew up in the foul, shallowest faith tradition that's ever been invented. It's not even a Christian religion at this point. Um, I say with shame. But I'm just saying this as an observer of what's going on. There is no way to assess, say, the transgenderist movement with that mindset. Policy papers don't account for it at all. If you have people who are saying, I have an idea, let's castrate the next generation. Let's sexually mutilate children. I'm sorry, that's not a political debate. What? It has nothing to do with politics. What's the outcome we're desiring here? An androgynous population? Is that really what we are? Are we arguing for that? I don't, I don't think anyone could like, defend that as a positive outcome. But the weight of the government and uh, you know, a lot of corporate interests are behind that. Well, what is that? Well, it's irrational. If you say, well, you know, I think abortion is always bad. Well, I think sometimes it's necessary. That's a debate I'm familiar with. But if you're telling me that abortion is a positive good, what are you saying? Well, you're arguing for child sacrifice, obviously. It's not about like, oh, a teen, you know, a teen girl gets pregnant and what do we do about that and victims of rape. I, you know, I get it. I, of course I understand that and I have compassion for everyone involved. But when the Treasury Secretary stands up and says, you know what you can do to help the economy get an abortion? Well, you, that's like an Aztec principle, actually. There's not a society in history that didn't practice human sacrifice. Not one. I checked. Even the Scandinavians, I'm ashamed to say. It wasn't just the Mesoamericans. It was everybody. So like, that's what that is. Well, what's the point of child sacrifice? Well, there's no policy goal entwined with that. No, that's a theological phenomenon. And that's kind of the point I'm making. None of this makes sense in conventional political terms. When people or crowds of people, or the largest crowd of people at all, which is the federal government, the largest human organization in human history, decide that the goal is to destroy things, destruction for its own sake, hey, let's tear it down. What you're watching is not a political movement, it's evil. So if you want to assess, and I'll put it in non, and I'll stop with this, I'll put it in non, I'll put it in non-political, uh, or non, rather non-specific theological terms, and just say, if you want to know what's evil and what's good, what are the characteristics of those? And by the way, you know, I, I think the Athenians would have agreed with this. This is not necessarily just a Christian notion. This is kind of a, I would say, widely agreed upon understanding of good and evil. What are its products? What do these two conditions produce? Well, I mean, good is characterized by order, calmness, tranquility, peace, whatever you want to call it, lack of conflict, cleanliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness. It's true. It is. And evil is characterized by their opposites. Violence, hate, disorder, division, disorganization, and filth. So if you are all in on the things that produce the latter basket of outcomes, what you're really advocating for is evil. That's just true. I'm not calling for a religious war, far from it. I'm merely calling for an acknowledgement of what we're watching, which is not what, and I'm not, certainly not backing the Republican Party. I mean, ugh. I'm not making a partisan point at all. I'm, I'm just noting what's super obvious. Like those of us who are in our mid-50s are caught in the past in the way that we think about this. One side's like, no, no, you know, I've got this idea 
And we've got this idea, and let's have a debate about our ideas. They don't want a debate. Those ideas won't produce outcomes that any rational person would want under any circumstances. Those are manifestations of some larger force acting upon us. It's just so obvious. It's completely obvious. And I think two things. One, we should say that and stop engaging in these totally fraudulent debates where we are using the terms that we used in 1991 when I started at Heritage as if maybe, you know, I could just win the debate if I marshaled more facts. I've tried that, doesn't work. And two, maybe we should all take just like 10 minutes a day to say a prayer about it. I'm serious, like why not? And I'm saying that to you, not as some kind of evangelist, I'm literally saying that to you as an Episcopalian, the Samaritans of our time. I'm coming to you from the most humble and lowly theological position you can. I'm literally an Episcopalian, okay? And even I have concluded it might be worth taking just 10 minutes out of your busy schedule to say a prayer for the future, and I hope you will. <laughs>